This is a WMUR Commitment 2024 special in partnership with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Conversation with the candidate. And now, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Hello and welcome to our Conversation with the Candidate series. I'm Adam Sexton and our guest is Democratic Presidential Candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We'll be getting to know Mr. Kennedy and where he stands on key issues. At the start of our show, I'll be asking the candidates some questions and then after a break, we'll have our studio audience ask their questions in a town hall format. But before we begin with that, let's take a quick look at the candidate's biography. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says he has carried on his family's legacy of public service by devoting himself to environmental causes and children's welfare. He was the founder of the Waterkeeper Alliance, the world's largest clean water advocacy group, and was chief litigation counsel for Children's Health Defense, which among other things advocates in the vaccine resistance movement. Kennedy is also an award-winning writer, including two New York Times bestsellers, 2005's Crimes Against Nature and 2021's The Real Anthony Fauci. He says his campaign for president is fighting for progressive issues, stopping what he calls the rigging of the system and the war against America's middle class. Kennedy graduated from Harvard University, studied at the London School of Economics, and earned his law degree from the University of Virginia. He is married to actress Cheryl Hines. The couple has seven children, including Kennedy's six children from two previous marriages. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is the third of 11 children of the late Senator Robert Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us on Conversation with the Candidate. We appreciate having you here. Happy to be back here with you, Adam. So when it comes to campaign politics, the Kennedy name stands for something. The fight for economic justice, the fight against uh, uh, racial injustice, and also youth engagement. Those themes couldn't be bigger in the Democratic Party right now, a big plus for your candidacy. You also have President Joe Biden basically saying to New Hampshire, pound sand. I'm going to take away the New Hampshire primary, the first in the nation tradition that's been there for 100 years. Reportedly, he's not going to campaign here or put his name on the ballot. So really, the table couldn't be any more beautifully set for a candidate just like you. And yet, rather than focusing intently on progressive voters here in New Hampshire, we see you talking about things and engaging with audiences that might not necessarily win you over the most Democratic votes here in New Hampshire. So why not focus like a laser on those Kennedy themes rather than getting sidetracked on other issues? Well, I've been, I think I've been focused on the, the themes that, um, that the Democratic Party has represented. You know, particularly I would say the theme that I'm going to be talking about tonight at my, uh, at my speech at St. Essence College on peace, which is uh, the, the 60th anniversary of my uncle President Kennedy's uh, famous peace, peace speech at American University. The Democratic Party has, I think that the country really uh, went into a, a, a bad direction after President Kennedy's death, uh, which is that all of his successors, you know, he, he steadfastly resisted sending uh, combat troops anywhere in the world during the thousand days that he was in office. He did send 16,000 military advisors to Vietnam. He was his military industrial complex, his intelligence apparatus were begging him to send 250,000 combat troops. He refused. He refused to go into Laos. He refused to go into Berlin. He refused to go into Cuba. Um, a month before he died in October of 63, he heard that one of the Green Berets had been killed in Vietnam of those advisors, and he asked one of his aides for a list of combat casualties, and there were 75, and when he read that, he said, that's too many Americans dying in Vietnam. That's their war. And that day, he signed a national security order, 263, ordering all troops home from Vietnam. Um, a, a, a month later, he was killed. A week after that, President Johnson remanded that order. We ended up sending 560,000 troops there. Uh, 56,000 never came back, including my cousin, George Skakel, who died in the Tet Offensive, and millions of, at least a million Vietnamese were killed after my uncle's death. All of his successors then ended up sending combat troops abroad, and the role of the United States was always a peacemaker in the world. And the Democratic Party, which was the party of peace, um, kind of disappeared. And now, you know, particularly recently and during this administration, we've become the party of the neocons and, you know, of this very belligerent and violent foreign policy. That is not only uh, destroying, eroding our moral authority around the world, but it, it is uh, 
it is bankrupting the middle class in our country. One of the obstacles also that's keeping you essentially from that base of the Democratic Party is your history of anti-vaccine activism. Medical community, the medical establishment, considers you a dangerous purveyor of vaccine misinformation and a threat to public health, is saying. The Los Angeles Times has that as a headline. So ultimately, the people of New Hampshire will make up their mind about this. They're going to take measure of you as a candidate and a person, your views, your policy positions. My question is this, if you're the president, how does vaccine policy change? And we know this is more of a state-by-state -state issue, but how at the federal level will you bring your views to bear at the federal government? Well, it is a federal issue because the federal government recommends and approves new vaccines. And I, my only argument, I've never been anti-vaccine. I'm called, called anti-vaccine because that's a way of kind of marginalizing and discrediting me in the view of the public. But I've never, I had all my children vaccinated. I was fully vaccinated. And I've never been anti-vaccine. I'm, uh, but what I've said is I'm pro-science and pro-safety, and we ought to subject vaccines, which are mandated for healthy children, uh, not for sick people. We we ought to subject them to at least the kind of rigorous uh, placebo-controlled trials that are mandated for every other medicine. It's the only medicine that's exempt from pre-licensing safety trials and none of the vaccines that are currently on the, the 70 you know i got three shots a kid my my kids got 72 shots which are now you know essentially mandated for american children and none of them have been subjected to pre-licensing safety trials and uh, and what i would do is say hey, let's do the trials let's find out what the risk profile is what the benefit profile is and then allow uh, parents to make up their minds about you know whether they want to whether way they want to use vaccines for their children each of those vaccines that ought to be a free choice all right mr kennedy enough questions here let's get to that town hall audience out in studio b coming up after the break we'll bring our studio audience into the conversation stay with us Picking us up from television here in the last half hour, we had Mr. Kennedy talking about the issue of immigration. Mr. Kennedy, you've been to the border. You've seen the crossings coming across. Really, this is a massive humanitarian crisis. So as president, what would you do about it? Yeah, can I describe it first, yeah. kind of what I saw? Because I went, I flew down to Yuma, and then, uh, and then at 1 o'clock arrived at the, 1 o'clock a.m. arrived at the, uh, at the, uh, at the border. And the, the first group that, when I arrived there, there was a group coming across of about, I think it was two busloads, it was about 100 and, uh, and maybe about 100 people um, who were all West Africans. So I had expected I'd see a lot of Central Americans, people from Salvador and Panama and Guatemala, um, but that's not what it was. It was all Africans, African men, military age. Most of them were from Senegal. Next group that came across uh, was, and they're, they're just waiting in line to cross. Hundreds and hundreds of people. They come in buses of 55 each, and they're, they're let off about a half mile, and then they walk to the, the gap in the fence, and they walk around. The next group I went and talked to them, and they were, there was only two families that were from Latin America, one from Colombia, one from Peru. The rest were from Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tibet, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Nepal, China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Eastern Europe. And what's happening, you know, what it, and, and as I said, it's the insanity of it. They brought across their fingerprinted to see if they have criminal records. If they don't, they're asked one question by the Border Patrol, do you have a contact in this country? And if they say yes, the Border Patrol says, can you put us on the phone with that contact? If they can do that, if they can get them on a cell phone, the Border Patrol asks them, if we put this family on an airplane, will you pick them up at Minneapolis or, you know, or San Diego or, um, or, uh, or Chicago and New York, and if that person says yes, and they take them to the airport, FEMA pays for their ticket, and they go anywhere they want in the country. Seven million people have come across. The cartels control all the immigration, and they have shifted from drug smuggling to make this one of their big um, you know, profit lines. 
So they are sending videos, social videos, social media videos all over the world, recruiting people from countries. They have lawyers who are working with them in other countries. They, they, and they tell them exactly what to do. You get on a plane to Mexico City, the, uh, the cartels help you get a visa in Mexico City for Mexico. They then put you on an internal plane to Mexicali. The cartels have a, a parking lot filled with buses at Mexicali. You get on one of those buses and then they drive you to the, um, you know, to the, to the crossing and there are nine big crossings. Oh, and the one I went to was in Yuma, and you know, the night I went there, probably six to eight hundred people came across, and uh, and the, uh, the little town of Yuma is bearing a lot of the initial burden because a lot of these people are sick, so they go to the hospital. There's a lot of pregnant women. I talked to the, the uh, I spent a day with the head of the hospital, and he said that a few months ago there were so many pregnant immigrants in his hospital. They occupied 32 of the 35 beds on the maternity ward and a lot of local women who had scheduled pregnancy inductions, you know, induced, induced births, um, C-sections, whatever, could not get in, had to cancel or postpone their appointments. He said that he spent $27 million of the hospital's budget last year unreimbursed to take care of the immigrants. And they, you know, we talked with the sheriff who, said, who told us, because the entire border patrol is now processing people, there's nobody guarding the border and the drugs are pouring across through the other place. If you're a smuggler or a bad guy, you don't come through that fence around that fence. These are all people who intend to stay in this country. They, when they stay, they're given a court, case, a court date seven years from now. And, uh, and so, and meanwhile, there's a million immigrants who, who are legally coming here, 1.1 million immigrants who go through the whole process, which could take them eight or 10 years. And this is like a stick in the face for them. So, you know, no country can survive if it can't, if it, if it can't control its borders, and we're not doing that. The good news is this, that everybody that I talked to there said that this is easy to stop that the way to stop it is very, very simple and that they've been doing it before. Now, I didn't like to hear this because I don't, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump. I did not like his wall. But what the Border Patrol and the, everybody else said is, you don't need to build a physical barrier from San Diego, 2,200 miles to Brownsville, Texas. You do need a physical barrier in certain places where there's high density populations. The rest of it you can monitor with, uh, with ground monitoring, very, very sophisticated surveillance and ground monitoring systems. Many of those were put up during the Trump administration, but for some reason, the Biden administration, when it came in, took down the towers and they removed the ground sensing systems. This is not something that, as a Democrat, that I want to hear. And, and then, you know, once it got out that this is an open border and the uh, the cartels saw that there's a huge profit um, opportunity here. Uh, the the flow has just increased exponentially, and, but we can stop it. During the Trump administration, the crossings at Yuma were about 10 to 25 a day at most. Now, as I said, they're you know they're 200 to 800 a day. So you know we can solve this problem, but you know, we need to do it in a way that's sensible, that's common sense, and that. Uh, that is not causing this terrible, terrible humanitarian crisis. Uh, from where I sat on the border, there's a tree that you can see on the other side of the fence, but it's in U.S. territory. It's called the rape tree. And it's where the cartels extract their final payment from women who come across, sometimes from children. Uh, the, the Border Patrol watches helplessly why they do this. I talked to people, you know, this Peruvian family that I talked to that had lost their life savings because of the... The cartels rob them, they beat them, they extort them, they exploit them, and ultimately they rape them. And you know, this is a humanitarian crisis that we, uh, that uh, you know, that we're creating through government negligence, and we need to end it for everybody's sake. Thank you for taking my question. Um, our world is really a mess. Our country is a mess. People are um, angry and hurting each other. 
And so my question to you is, how would you as president unite us as Americans? Uh, the question is, how am I, would I unite people and sort of end the polarization? You know, my dad had faced the same thing when he ran for president against, uh, against the sitting president of his own party, the same as I'm doing, mm -hmm. in 1968. And, you know, my father um, made a, and he succeeded in uniting the country. The day that he died, he won the most rural state in our country, South Dakota, and the most urban state, California. And he had succeeded in bridging that gap. And this was at a time that was almost as polarized as we are today because of the Vietnam War, civil rights, our cities were burning. Um, you know, the National Guard was, was federalized and was shooting students on campuses. So it was really a, a, a very, very hard time in our history and nearly as much polarization. My father did this by, uh, by telling the truth to people. And, and they, he, was, he was running at a time when he, when, when he decided to run, run, he was running for moral reasons. Because of the Vietnam War, he did not believe that. He, he didn't want to run. He didn't think he could win. He was going to sit it out. But he, he worried that somebody would put a microphone in his face and say, are you for Eugene McCarthy, who he did not like, who he thought was in the tank with the insurance companies? or Lyndon Johnson, who he couldn't support because of the war, or Na Richard Nixon, and he couldn't support any of them. And so he felt like the only thing he could do that was honest and for the right was to run himself, even though he had no chance to win. He'd run his brother's campaign eight years before, and, uh, but then they had the unions on their side. They had the big city mayors. They had the liberal newspapers like the New York Times. All of those were against my father. The only unions he had was the UAW and the, and the you know, Cesar Chavez, United Farm Workers. And all the people who had been with him when he ran the first time and had gone into the new frontier were now working for Johnson. So he was really alone when he decided to run. And, and yet, and, and it freed him to tell the truth to people. So when he went to Creighton University in Indiana and the students say, are, are you going to preserve our, our draft deferments? He, uh, uh, McCarthy said, yeah. He said, no, I'm not, because 45% of the paratroopers in Vietnam are black. And it's unfair. I can get my kids into college and get the deferment. And it's unfair and wrong in our country that our wars are being fighting by black kids who can't get, their, can't get to buy that deferment. And he was booed. And, you know, he said, how does that sit with your Catholic values? Mm. And he, he engaged him in that discussion. In the end, he was given a standing ovation when he went to the Indiana, or to the, um, Indiana Medical School. He, the students asked him, who's going to pay for your health care? And he said, you are. And they booed him. By the end of that conversation, they were applauding him. When he went to Watts, you know, which was on fire, he talked to them about the importance of abiding by the law which was not a popular thing you know, in those communities. And he went to the University of Alabama, which he had forcibly integrated five years before uh, by sending the, federalizing the National Guard, sending 18,000 troops down there. He talked about civil rights. He was given a standing ovation. When I was with him when he died in Los Angeles, and we brought him back to New York, uh, to, to New York to wake him at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And then we took him on this ride from Penn Station in, in Manhattan to Union Station in Washington, DC. It was supposed to be a two and a half hour ride. It was seven and a half hours because there, uh, there were two and a half million people on that train track. And they were the entire cross section of the American experience. When we went through the urban train stations that crawled through at two miles an hour, through Newark, uh, uh, Trenton, uh, Wilmington, Baltimore, there were black faces, tens of thousands of them singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Um, in, the, in the countryside, there were whites, there were Catholics, there were rabbis, there were priests. I remember seven nuns standing in the back of a pickup truck right outside of Wil Wilmington, Ray, waving their rosaries at us when I passed, little leaguers standing at attention, uh, Boy Scouts, and, um, and it was the cross-section of the American experience. And I remember four years later reading, um, uh, I was going to college by then, and I was reading demographic data from that election from 1972, where, McGovern, where George McGovern had run, who was aligned with my father on every issue. And what this data showed is that those white people 
who had lined that track to want to say goodbye to my dad and who had supported him in the election, four years later were not supporting George McGovern, who was aligned with my dad on everything. Instead, they were supporting George Wallace, who was antithetical to everything my father believed in. He was a racist, a bigot, a, you know, a segregationist. And it occurred to me then, and it, it has struck me many times since, that every nation, like every individual, is has a darker side and a lighter side, and that the easiest thing for a politician to do is to appeal to our bigotry and our hatred and our anger and our greed and xenophobia and tribalism, and that my father tried to do something different, which is to appeal to our populist impulses and instincts, but do it by finding our better natures, by getting us to step outside of our own narrow self-interest, to transcend that, and to see ourselves as part of a larger community, part of this kind of noble experiment in you know, the American experiment in self-governance, to help us find a hero in each of us and take the risks that it takes to stand up for something, for a community that may not look all like you, and to avoid the seduction of the notion that we can advance ourselves as a people by leaving our poor brothers and sisters behind. And he was able to do that, and he did it successfully. And I, you know, I, every populist movement can be hijacked by, you know, by demagogues who are appealing to our darker angels. And that the challenge is the challenge that I hope to manifest is to, uh, is to persuade Americans that we are part of a community and that we, there's ways by, by focusing not on the issues that keep us apart, but for, on the values that unite us that we have in common, to run a campaign that focuses on those values and focuses on solutions that are going to work for everybody, rather than the narrow tribalistic solutions that you know, have been part of the debate so far. And that's why I don't take the easy you know, democratic answer on gun control because it hasn't worked so far. It just hasn't worked. It's just divided us. We all, but, but what's the thing we have in common? We all want to protect our children. So let's figure out a way to do that that doesn't impede on somebody's deeply held values, other Americans' deeply held values. And if we start trusting each other again, maybe ultimately we can get gun control, sensible common sense gun control through consensus, other than forcing it down people's throats. So that's what I hope to do with my campaign. Conversation with the candidate continues right now. Thank you for clicking on our extended conversation with the candidate with the candidate this evening, uh, Democratic candidate for president, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We have our studio audience of New Hampshire voters here with their questions. We'll get to as many of those as we can. But for those of you picking us up from television here in the last half hour, we had Mr. Kennedy talking about the issue of immigration. Mr. Kennedy, you've been to the border. You've seen the crossings coming across. Really, this is a massive humanitarian crisis. So as president, what would you do about it? Yeah, can I describe it first, yeah. kind of what I saw? Because I went... I flew down to Yuma, and then uh, and then at one o'clock arrived at the one o'clock a.m. arrived at the um, at the uh, at the border, and the the first group that when I arrived there there was a group coming across of about I think it was two busloads it was about a hundred and uh, and maybe about a hundred people um, who were all West Africans. So I had expected I'd see a lot of Central Americans, people from Salvador and Panama and Guatemala, um, but that's not what it was. It was all Africans, African men, military age. Most of them were from Senegal. Next group that came across uh, was, and they're, they're just waiting in line to cross. Hundreds and hundreds of people. They come in buses of 55 each, and they're, they're let off about a half mile, and then they walk to the, the gap in the fence and they walk around. The next group, I went and talked to them, and they were, there was only two families that were from Latin America, one from Colombia, one from Peru. The rest were from Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tibet, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Nepal, China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Eastern Europe, and What's happening, you know, what, and as I said, it's the insanity of it. 
they're brought across, they're fingerprinted to see if they have criminal records. If they don't, they're asked one question by the Border Patrol, do you have a contact in this country? And if they say yes, the Border Patrol says, can you put us on the phone with that contact? If they can do that, if they can get them on a cell phone, the Border Patrol asks them, if we put this family on an airplane, will you pick them up at Minneapolis or, you know, or San Diego or, um, or, uh, uh, or Chicago or New York? And if that person says yes, and they take them to the airport, FEMA pays for their ticket, and they go anywhere they want in the country. Seven million people have come across. The cartels control all the immigration, and they have shifted from drug smuggling to make this one of their big um, you know, profit lines. So they are sending videos, social video, social media videos all over the world, recruiting people from countries. They have lawyers who are working with them in other countries, they, they, and they tell them exactly what to do. You get on a plane to Mexico City, the, uh, the cartels help you get a visa in Mexico City for Mexico. They then put you on an internal plane to Mexicali. The cartels have a, a parking lot filled with buses at Mexicali. You get on one of those buses and then they drive you to the, um, you know, to the, to the crossing and there are nine big crossings. Oh, and the one I went to was in Yuma and you know, the night I went there, probably six to 800 people came across. And, uh, and the, uh, the little town of Yuma is bearing a lot of the initial burden because a lot of these people are sick, so they go to the hospital. There's a lot of pregnant women. I talked to them. The, uh, the, I spent a day with the head of the hospital, and he said that a few months ago, there were so many pregnant immigrants in his hospital. They occupied 32 of the 35 beds on the maternity ward, and a lot of local women who had scheduled pregnancy inductions, you know, induced, induced births, um, C-sections, whatever, could not get in, had to cancel or postpone their appointments. He said that he spent $27 million of the hospital's budget last year unreimbursed to take care of the immigrants. And, they, you know, we talked with the sheriff who, said, who told us because the entire Border Patrol is now processing people, there's nobody guarding the border and the drugs are pouring across through the other place. If you're a smuggler or a bad guy, you don't come through that fence around that fence. These are all people who intend to stay in this country. They, when they stay, they're given a court, case, a court date seven years from now. And, uh, and so, and meanwhile, there's a million immigrants who, who are legally coming here, 1.1 million immigrants who go through the whole process, which could take them eight or 10 years. And this is like a stick in the face for them. So, you know, no country can survive if it can't if it, if it can't control its borders, and we're not doing that. The good news is this, that everybody that I talked to there said that this is easy to stop. That the way to stop it is very, very simple, and that they've been doing it before. Now, I didn't like to hear this because I don't, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump. I did not like his wall. But what the Border Patrol and the, everybody else said is, you don't need to build a physical barrier from San Diego, 2,200 miles to Brownsville, Texas. You do need a physical barrier in certain places where there's high density populations. The rest of it you can monitor with, uh, with ground monitoring, very, very sophisticated surveillance and ground monitoring systems. Many of those were put up during the Trump administration, but for some reason, the Biden administration, when it came in, took down the towers and they remove the ground sensing systems. This is not something that, as a Democrat, that I want to hear. And, and then, you know, once it got out that this is an open border and uh, the cartels saw that there's a huge profit um, opportunity here, uh, the, the flow has just increased exponentially. And, but we can stop it. During the Trump administration, the crossings at Humor were about 10 to 25 a day at most. Now, as I said, they're, you know, they're 200 to 800 a day. So, you know, we can solve this problem, but you know, we need to do it in a way that's sensible, that's common sense, and that, uh, that is not causing this terrible, terrible humanitarian crisis. Uh, from where I sat on the border, there's a tree that you can see. 
on the other side of the fence, but it's in U.S. territory. It's called the rape tree. And it's where the cartels extract their final payment from women who come across, sometimes from children. Uh, the, the Border Patrol watches helplessly why they do this. I talked to people, you know, this Peruvian family that I talked to that had lost their life savings because the, the, the cartels robbed them, they beat them, they extort them, they exploit them. And ultimately, they rape them. And, you know, this is a humanitarian crisis that we, uh, that, uh, you know, that we're creating through government negligence. And we need to end it for everybody's sake. Let's get to a question from Ken Berlin. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, welcome. Uh, this kind of dovetails with your uh, vaccine thoughts or whatever. I was glad to hear what you said up there. But uh, when we get our next pandemic, like we had with COVID, how would you attack that? How would you try to get the country squared away so that we wouldn't be uh, suffering like we did in the last one? Uh, I mean, the answer to that is I would do uh, the pandemic preparedness protocols from WHO, CDC, the European Medical Association, the NHS, National Health Service in England, have said for decades, which is you quarantine, you don't do mass lockdowns ever. You quarantine the sick, you isolate the vulnerable, and you, um, and then you look for, particularly uh, uh, for off-the-shelf therapeutic drugs that treat the illness. You don't lock everybody in and say you're waiting for a vaccine that is untested, and that you know nobody knows whether it's going to work or not. You actually treat people who are sick. This is the first respiratory illness in the history of medicine where you could go into the hospital with a positive PCR test and symptomatic. And the hospital will say, there is nothing we're going to do for you. You go home till your lips turn blue and you can't breathe and then come back here and we're going to give you two things that will kill you, intubation and remdesivir. Meanwhile, we're depriving people of drugs that are proven of Zithromax, of Ivermectin, of hydroxychloroquine that were proven. The countries that use those drugs had a fraction of the deaths we did. Why is it, if what we were doing worked, why did we have the highest body count of any country in the world? We have 4.2% of the global population. How in the world did we get 16% of the COVID deaths? It doesn't make any sense. Meanwhile, nations that, get, that avoided vaccines and gave their populations ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, and other early treatments, many of them didn't even have a pandemic. Nigeria, Nigeria is, has the highest malaria burden in the world. So almost all the population is on hydroxychloroquine. They take it once a week. It's called Sunday, Sunday. Everybody takes it on Sunday. And it also has the highest river blindness burden in the world. So a lot of the path or large part of the population is on ivermectin. The death rate in Nigeria was 14 people per million population. The death rate in our country was 3,000 per million population, 200 times what they had in Nigeria. Nigeria had a 1.3% vaccination rate. So it wasn't vaccines that had anything to do with ending the pandemic. If you look across the board, the countries that were the heavily, most heavily vaccinated had the highest death rates from COVID consistently. The, those that had lower vaccines and depended in, instead on, uh, on therapeutic drugs did much better. In fact, there's states in India, there's a state called Kerala that adopted our protocols and had death rates similar to ours. The nearby state of Uttar Pradesh, which has 230 million people, so it, its population is comparable to the United States. As soon as they started giving people ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, the pandemic ended there. We should be, what we should have done is we should have, instead of using the internet to suppress debate, to censor people, to punish doctors who are speaking out and saying, we should be using early treatments. I'm giving it to my patients and they're recovering miraculously. Those people, these, these doctors of conscience, were silenced. We should do the opposite. We should have a, we should have built a grid, and this is what I'll do, that reaches all 15 million frontline physicians in the world and where they report what they're doing and what's working and what's not working and all that information then gets synthesized through AI. 
so we can quickly spit out to all the other practicing physicians, this is what they're doing in Bangladesh and they've eliminated it, or this is what they're doing in China or Guatemala or Central America. And, but we didn't do any of that. Instead, we, we used the pandemic as a pretext for clamping down these you know, controls on, uh, you know, on our freedoms and, um, and to promote med medications that didn't work. I mean, one of the things that people should know, the government, the, the people who were promoting the vaccine had to get rid of all the competitive products. And why is that? Because there's a federal law, the Code of Federal Regulations, that says if you, that you cannot give an emergency use authorization to any vaccine if there is an existing medicine that has shown to be effective against the target disease. So that's why they had to tell us that ivermectin was a horse medication that didn't work. It's not a horse medication. It is given to horses because it works for all mammals. But it, it won the no, it's one of the only products in the world that has won the Nobel Prize because it was effective for humans. It's been given billions and billions of doses and it's eliminated uh, river blindness and other parasites around the world. We should have focused on things that work rather than focusing on advancing the mercantile interests of the pharmaceutical industry. Next Thank question you. from Spencer Beck. Hi, sir. Thanks for being here. Should nuclear technology play a role in our country's transition to cleaner and more sustainable sources of energy? I'm all for nuclear energy if it can be made, uh, if it can be made safe and if it can be made economically competitive. Right now, it's not safe, and, it, and you shouldn't take my word for it. You should take the word of the insurance industry, which is the ultimate arbiter of risk in this country. The insurance companies will not insure nuclear power. And so, so the nuclear industry had to go to Congress in a sleazy legislative maneuver in the middle of the night and price the, pass the Price-Anderson Act, uh, which immunizes, essentially immunizes the nuclear industry from, the, uh, from accountability for its own accidents. Oh, my, in my house in Mount Kisco, New York, which was 22 miles from Indian Point Power Plant, I had a provision in my home insurance policy that says this policy does not cover you uh, for radiation damage from a, a nuclear power plant accident. So all of the home insurance policies in this country have something essentially like that. Oh, so you are bearing the burden of their risk, and they and and they they don't have to pay any attention to risk because the comp the country is immunized them. The other thing is, is it is it economic? Uh, no. The the last nuclear power plant built at a price per gigawatt hour of $14 billion per, not per gigawatt production uh, capacity. So a, a solar plant right now costs, the construction cost costs about a billion dollars a gigawatt. A, um, a wind plant costs about 1.1 billion a gigawatt. A, uh, a coal plant costs about 3.6 a gigawatt. Um, so, you know, the, a solar plant costs one fourteenth of what a nuke plant costs, and uh, we, you know, we could make energy by burning prime rib if we wanted, but it wouldn't make any sense. And, uh, and, uh, um, and then, once you build a solar and wind plant, it's free energy forever, because the electrons are hitting the earth for free. All we're doing is building a system to pick them up and harvest them. Once you build a new plant, then you have to go do uranium mining at very, very expensive. You have to have regular outages. You have to hire, uh, you know, do safety and, and technicians that are, that are ruinously expensive. And then you have to dispose of the waste and take care of it for the next 30,000 years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. Oh, how can it possibly be economic? It's pretty, but if they make, if they figure out those problems, they told us when they first built these plants they would, that nuclear energy would be too cheap to meter. It's turned out to be the most prohibitively expensive way to buy a boil a pot of water that's ever been devised. And now they're saying, well, don't worry, we've got a new generation of nukes that solve a lot of these problems. And my answer to that is, show us. Show us that, you know, number one, no nuclear facility will be built anywhere in the world unless no utility will build any. 
unless the public subsidizes essentially the entire cost of construction. That's not, that's not competitive. They should pay for all of their costs, including the disposal of their ways, which was a lesson we were all supposed to have learned in kindergarten. And, um, and you know, not tell the public, if they, if they can do it without public assistance and if they can be competitive in a marketplace, I'm all for them. Thank you. Next question from Karen Manaski. Hey, Karen. Thank you for taking my question. Um, our world is really a mess. Our country is a mess. People are um, angry and hurting each other. And so my question to you is, how would you as president unite us as Americans? Uh, the question is, how would I unite people and sort of end the polarization? You know, my dad had faced the same thing when he ran for president against, uh, against a sitting president of his own party, the same as I'm doing, mm -hmm. in 1968. And, you know, my father um, made a, and he succeeded in uniting the country. The day that he died, he won the most rural state in our country, South Dakota, and the most urban state, California. And he had succeeded in bridging that gap. And this was at a time that was almost as polarized as we are today because of the Vietnam War, civil rights, our cities were burning. Um, you know, the National Guard was, was federalized and was shooting students on campuses. So it was really a, a, a very, very hard time in our history and nearly as much polarization. My father did this by, uh, by telling the truth to people. And, and they, he was, he was running at a time when he, when, when he decided to run, run, he was running for moral reason. Because of the Vietnam War, he did not believe that, he, he didn't want to run, he didn't think he could win. He was going to sit it out, but he, he worried that somebody would put a microphone in his face and say, are you for Eugene McCarthy, who he did not like, who he thought was in the tank with the insurance companies, or Lyndon Johnson, who he couldn't support because of the war, or Na Richard Nixon. And he couldn't support any of them. And so he felt like the only thing he could do that was honest and for the right was to run himself, even though he had no chance to win. He'd run his brother's campaign eight years before. And, uh, but then they had the unions on their side. They had the big city mayors. They had the liberal newspapers like the New York Times. All of those were against my father. The only unions he had was the UAW and the, and the you know, Cesar Chavez, United Farm Workers. And all the people who had been with him when he ran the first time and had gone into the new frontier were now working for Johnson. So he was really alone when he decided to run. And, and yet, and, and it freed him to tell the truth to people. So when he went to Creighton University in Indiana and the students say, are, are you gonna preserve our, our draft deferments? He, uh, uh, McCarthy said, yeah. He said, no, I'm not, because 45% of the paratroopers in Vietnam are black. And it's unfair. I can get my kids into college and get the deferment. And it's unfair and wrong in our country that our wars are being fighting by black kids who can't get their, can't get the, buy that deferment. And he was booed. And, you know, he said, how does that sit with your Catholic values? Mm. And he, he engaged in that discussion in the end. He was given a standing ovation when he went to the Indiana, or to the um, Indiana Medical School. He, the students asked him, who's going to pay for your health care? And he said, you are. And they booed him. By the end of that conversation, they were applauding him. When he went to Watts, you know, which was on fire, he talked to them about the importance of abiding by the law, which was not a popular thing you know, in those communities. When he went to the University of Alabama, which he had forcibly integrated five years before uh, by sending the, federalizing the National Guard, sending 18,000 troops down there, he talked about the civil rights. He was given a standing ovation. When I was with him when he died in Los Angeles, and we brought him back to New York, uh, to, to, New York to wake him at St. Patrick's Cathedral, and then we took him on this ride from Penn Station in, in Manhattan to Union Station in Washington, D.C. It was supposed to be a two and a half hour ride. It was seven and a half hours, because there was, uh, there were, two and a half million people on that train track. And they were the entire cross-section of the American experience when we went through the urban train stations that crawled through at two miles an hour, through Newark, uh, uh, Trenton, uh, Wilmington, Baltimore. There were black faces, tens of thousands of them, singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. 
Um, in, the, in the countryside, there were whites, there were Catholics, there were rabbis, there were priests. I remember seven nuns standing in the back of a pickup truck right outside of well, Wilmington Ray, waving their rosaries at us when I passed, little leaguers standing at attention, uh, Boy Scouts, and, um, and it was the cross-section of the American experience. And I remember four years later reading, um, uh, I was going to college by then, and I was reading demographic data from that election from 1972, where, McGovern, where George McGovern had run, who was aligned with my father in every issue. And what this data showed is that those white people who had lined that track to say goodbye to my dad, and who had supported him in the election, four years later were not supporting George McGovern, who was aligned with my dad on everything. Instead, they were supporting George Wallace, who was antithetical to everything my father believed in. He was a racist, a bigot, a, you know, a segregationist. And it occurred to me then, and it, it has struck me many times since, that every nation, like every individual, is has a darker side and a lighter side, and that the easiest thing for a politician to do is to appeal to our bigotry and our hatred and our anger and our greed and xenophobia and tribalism, and that my father tried to do something different, which is to appeal to our populist impulses and instincts, but do it by finding our better natures, by getting us to step outside of our own narrow self-interest, to transcend that, and to see ourselves as part of a larger community, part of this kind of noble experiment in you know, the American experiment in self-governance, to help us find a hero in each of us and take the risks that it takes to stand up for something, for a community that may not look all like you, and to avoid the seduction of the notion that we can advance ourselves as a people by leaving our poor brothers and sisters behind. And he was able to do that, and he did it successfully. And I, you know, I, every populist movement can be hijacked by, you know, by demagogues who are appealing to our darker angels. And that the challenge is the challenge that I hope to manifest is to, uh, is to persuade Americans that we are part of a community and that we, there's ways that by, by focusing not on the issues that keep us apart, but for, on the values that unite us, that we have in common, to run a campaign that focuses on those values and focuses on solutions that are going to work for everybody, rather than the narrow tribalistic solutions that you know, have been part of the debate so far. And that's why I don't take the easy you know, democratic answer on gun control because it hasn't worked so far. It just hasn't worked, it's just divided us. We all, but, but what's the thing we have in common? We all wanna protect our children. So let's figure out a way to do that that doesn't impede on somebody's deeply held values, other Americans' deeply held values. And if we start trusting each other again, maybe ultimately we can get gun control, sensible common sense gun control through consensus, other than forcing it down people's throats. So oh, that's what I hope to do with my campaign. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy, next question from Susan Wilkinson. Hi, thank you for having the courage and backbone to tell the American voters the truth. And I hopefully you will be able to heal the divide. My question is, many former registered Democrats are hesitant to rejoin the party to vote for you given the past history of the DNC. This year they have already stated Biden is the candidate for the ticket. What would you say to these voters? How can you fight an entity that can decide what candidate will be on the ballot, regardless of what voters want it? Well, you know, what I would say is uh, you, you know, the voter has a choice. You can come out to the, uh, to the poll and you can support somebody who is not the DNC's choice. And I agree with you. We're, you know, we're living in a time in American history where there's so, you know, I, January 6th was a terrible, terrible moment in our history. The people who broke the law should go to jail or should be punished, you know, in whatever way is appropriate. But we need to look at kind of one of the larger messages, which is there's a huge group of people in this country who believe that the system is rigged against them and that the election system is rigged and it's not functioning. The same, I'm sure you weren't there on January 6th, but you just said the same thing to me. You said that you don't believe that the that as democracy is working, that we're no longer the party of the New Deal, we're the party of the rigged deal. 
and that, you know, we're picking candidates the way the Soviet Union did, which is that, you know, the party says, here's who you can vote for and here's not. And we ought to, at this point in history, when there's so many people like you and then people on the other side who, you know, who were at January 6th, that, that, the, that we need to be showing America and showing the world that we can conduct an election that is actually democratic. That is, you know, the template and the role model uh, for democratic elections in this country, and you know that people need to do uh, that. Poli We're not going to just let the politicians get billions of dollars from billionaire donors and then carpet bomb the country with advertisements and never actually have to shake a hand or meet a person, except in these. You know, highly staged rallies that they parachute in for once in a while, where everybody in that rally is handpicked, and you know, and the whole thing is staged, and it's kabuki theater. It's not politics. The thing that is what most disturbing of what the DNC is doing here in New Hampshire and in Iowa, these were the two states where you actually had to do retail politics, where you had to come in and shake hands with people and meet people in diners and nail salons and barber shops and gas stations and answer the question from, you know, the old lady in, in Keene, New Hampshire, who reads The Economist every week and is, you know, obsessed with the Financial Times and is asking you a question, then a follow-up question and another that you'll never get from CNN or even from The Times. And that happens here and then people don't make up their mind. Oftentimes, so they go into the polling booth in New Hampshire. There, there, there's this wonderful culture in this state of skepticism, of questioning, of you know, where you vet candidates for the rest of the nation the way that you would vet a, a city council candidate. And it's really important role for our country. And it, the same thing happens in Iowa, by the way. And the idea that the DNC has come in and just you know, pull the trap door under the two states where democracy actually happens is really insane to me. Uh, but I, you know, I think you do have a choice. You can go to the polls, uh, you can vote for me or, you know, an, another candidate and you can show that you still believe in democracy in the state of, of New Hampshire. Thanks. Almost out of time, Mr. Kennedy, I'll have one last question for you. You know, you mentioned your father's legacy. I'm curious, among your siblings and your cousins, who's supporting you? Who supports me? Um, my brothers, my brother Douglas, my sister Courtney. Um, uh, my, my, uh, I have a cop. I have one sister who, uh, who sends me notes every day that are very supportive, but she works for the Biden administration, so I don't want to <laughs> disclose her name. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have a lot of people, my kids, my kids all support me, but uh, they don't, let's be honest, <laughs> they don't really have a choice. I have a lot of them are still on the payroll at my house. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then um, I, they have a lot of cousins who are very excited about my candidacy. And, you know, I got, because I went on Joe Rogan a couple days ago, and they all, that, that generation all watches Joe Rogan, and they all send me really great messages. Um, and then uh, my, probably among my cousins, my strongest supporter is Anthony Shriver, who is uh, my cousin who I love, who started Best Buddies. And, but generally speaking, I have a lot of, I feel, you know, listen, I grew up in a family where we were encouraged every night to, not only encouraged, but basically uh, forced to argue with each other on different issues. And so we, you know, we would go to the dinner table every night and have these very, very passionate arguments and disagree with each other. My grandfather did that to my father's generation. And my grandmother would make us do the same thing. So we were raised with the idea that you can disagree with each other on issues and that you can still love each other. And I feel very loved by my family. I don't feel, I, I feel like, you know, they disagree with me. My, I, I have siblings who, passionately disagree with my position on the Ukraine, um, that passionately disagree with my position on vaccines. And, you know, they're entitled to their opinion. I don't begrudge them that. And, you know, so I think Biden represents their thoughts better than I, than I do. And they should go ahead and vote for them. But I, you know, I can love them anyway. And that, I think, is something that I hope for our whole country, that we can, you know, we can disagree with each other without hating each other. 
Mr. Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us on Conversation with the Candidate. Thank you to the audience and thank you to everyone watching at home. Thank you very much. Let me go. Oh yeah, yeah. Great job. Did you your Conversation with the Candidate continues right now. Welcome back to our conversation with the candidate, with the candidate, Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy. We're now going to have our questions from our town hall audience of New Hampshire voters here. I might jump in with a follow-up or two, but let's get right into it with Thalia Flores. Hi. Thalia. Thalia. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Um, other than your extensive environmental experience, what qualifies you to be the president? Uh, um, uh, thank you, Thalia. I, um, you know, I, I that one of the things in my campaign, one of the principal themes in my campaign, is this corrupt merger of state and corporate power, which has turned many of the regulatory agencies into predators against the American public and against the principles of our country. And these are the, you know, the, the um, and those agencies are agencies that I think I have a better. Uh, capacity to reform than any than almost anybody else who could run for this office, and the reason for that is I've spent many many years suing the litigating against these agencies. Oh, as 35 years as a, one of the leading environmental lawyers in this country, I filed hundreds of suits, over 500 suits, but about 20 percent of those were against EPA or the state regulatory agencies. And EPA is a captive agency. It's working, it no, it's no longer works exclusively for the American public. It's functioning to serve, in many cases, the mercantile interests of the industries that it's supposed to regulate. So when I sued Monsanto over Roundup, uh, one of the things that we discovered during the litigation process from, through discovery were email trains between top executives of Monsanto and the head of the pesticide division at uh, EPA, a man named Jess Rowland, who was secretly during all of those years working for Monsanto instead of the American people. And unfortunately, that is more the rule throughout these regulatory agencies than not. I'm representing a thousand uh, families in Columbia County, Ohio, on the Norfolk Southern spill, and the Norfolk Southern spill is the direct result of agency capture, of the, the, the capacity of the railroads to disable DOT's regulatory function and replace it and turn it into a sock puppet for the industry it's supposed to regulate. I've spent 20 years suing um, the, on, on the issues of, of factory farms and food processing industry, and USDA, is, which was created to foster the, and, and protect family farmers in this country and to protect the integrity of our food supply is now the instrument for, uh, for the, the monopoly takeover of American farming by these large corporations. And I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, I spent a lot of years suing Smithfield Food. Smithfield developed a form of producing hogs Smithfield went to alliance with a state senator from, from North Carolina um, named Wendell Murphy, who passed about 20 laws that made it almost impossible to sue a factory farm. No matter how much, you know, how badly they stink, how, many, how much poison is coming out of the farm, what they dump onto the land, etc. He then left and went into partnership with Smithfield, and they created a slaughterhouse in North Carolina that slaughters 30,000 hogs a day. They were able, because they control slaughter capacity, they were able to reduce the price of hogs to two cents a pound, it, from 60 cents a pound. It cost a farmer 32 cents a pound to, to, to get that hog to kill weight. So there, no farmer in the state could survive unless they signed a contract with Smithfield Food. So within a couple of years, 28,000 far family farmers had gone out of business and were replaced altogether about, by about 2,200 factory farms, either owned, about 80% of them owned or operated by one multinational company. 
and they were making money by dumping their waste into the waters, onto the land, etc. That company then put out a business because that, that model was so successful at reducing the, the, the price of hogs. They did the same thing in Iowa. Iowa had to adopt the same methodology and it was adopted all over the country. Then the Chinese, Smithfield Foods then sold itself to the Chinese. So now we have a situation where the Chinese own 80% of hog production all across our country and they control the landscapes. And you know, this is a direct violation of Thomas Jefferson's vision of an American democracy rooted in tens of thousands of independent freeholds all owned by family farmers, each with a stake in our system of government. So it's a threat not only to the middle class, to our food supply, our food safety, but also ultimately democracy. I don't think that there's any other person running in this country who has the capacity to correct those issues. Well, I, I've dealt so uh, intimately with these regulatory agencies. Usually when a politician comes into office in Washington, they vow to clean up the swamp. But they get there and they're intimidated by these agencies that may have 30,000 or 50,000 employees and they have no idea how to reform them. So they bring in somebody to run that agency, somebody who is safe, which is usually somebody from industry. So President Trump promised to reform Washington, but he came into office saying, I'm gonna, you know, even he even talked about medicine and about vaccines and these kinds of things. He then took a million dollars from Pfizer and he appointed a Pfizer partner, Scott Gottlieb, to run FDA. And, and another Pfizer handpicked nominee, Alex Azar, right from the middle of the pharmaceutical industry to run HHS. And Gottlieb then ushered through the Pfizer product and made $88 billion for his company and then left FDA to rejoin the Pfizer board. That's not ending the swamp. That is making the swamp even deeper. And I know, I know when I go in there how to fix DOT, how to fix HHS, NIH, CDC, EPA, all of the three later agencies because I've litigated against them and I've been thinking for 40 years how do you unravel corporate capture at these agencies? And I know how to do it. I know how to, re, uh, to, to, uh, um, to reorganize those agencies to end the revolving doors, to end these financial entanglements with the industries they're supposed to regulate. And in many cases, I know the specific individuals in those agencies who need to be moved out. And that's why I think I'm in better shape than anybody else to, to reform, to get the kind of reforms that the American people want. Thank you. Next question comes from Eileen Guerin. Hello, Mr. Kennedy. I was a Democrat for many years, decades, but the Democrats do not accommodate pro-lifers. What reason can you give me, to a pro-life voter, to vote for you regarding this divisive issue? Well, the only thing I can say to you on that issue is that um, I uh, I understand, you know, I come from a family that was, I'm pro-choice. So I, you know, I've worked, there, I don't think there's anybody in this country who has worked harder for medical freedom for bodily autonomy than me, and that applies to vaccines. I don't think the government should be telling us what medical products we can take, what procedures we ought to endure. I don't think the government has any business telling people what they can and cannot do with their body. I'm not going to be in a position, allow myself into a position where I'm going to be telling a woman to bring a child to term that she doesn't want. I don't think it's a good solution. I think every abortion is a tragedy. And, um, and you know, I, as I said, I came from a family that was very, very divided on this issue. I've seen pictures of uh, third term abortions and, uh, and I'm, I'm appalled by them. Um, but and we'll do everything I can to end those in other ways. But I don't think the government, I, I think the worst solution is that the government is involved in decisions that should be belong to a woman. Next question comes from Aldrian Rostrum. Hello, thank you for coming. 
Our country went to war in a foreign land over a rumor of weapons of mass destruction. We have weapons of mass destruction here, semi-automatic weapons, easily available with little documentation in our own country, and they're killing children. What will you do to confine semi-automatic weapons to use only by military and law enforcement? Yeah, um I am not going to take people's guns away, and I, I believe in gun control myself. Um, but I, you know, anybody who tells you that we can end the violence to our children that's going on now by removing people's guns, at, in, at the margin that has been left to us by this very expansive Supreme Court decision is not being truthful with you. So, you know, I think just legally, because of the, of the Supreme Court decision, because of the expansive vision, the view that the Supreme Court has taken on the Second Amendment, um, that it makes it really impossible to actually do anything about it in, in terms of limiting people's guns. I also want to say this, that, you know, I have spent a lot of my time on my life in rural communities in this country, and there is a gun culture in those communities that is closely tied to people's identities. And so those people that, that a large group of Americans see it as almost an existential threat. Um, when people in my political party and people like myself say to them that we're going to take your guns away, and it hasn't worked. It has polarized our country more, and it's made people dig in more. And I'm trying to end the polarization in our country. And I, so I think that this, and particularly in this point in history, in the last three years in this country, we've seen an all-out assault on our Bill of Rights. We've seen for the first time uh, the government participating in censoring people's speech. There is, you know, the, these revelations came out this week that the FBI has been collaborating with the SBU, the Ukrainian agency, to censor speech of Americans critical of U.S. policy against the Ukraine. We've seen the CIA and the FBI now ha had, during at least the last two administrations, at portals at Twitter where they could identify people who were speaking against government policies and silence them. And so we had these assaults on freedom of speech, we had the government come in and order without any scientific citation, without any democratic process, the closure of every church in this country for, for a year. We had an assault on freedom of religion. We had an assault with the, again, we had these social distancing um, regulations and policies that, uh, that, again, were not based upon, we now know, and Rachel Rolensky and Anthony Fauci have acknowledged, they were not based on science. There was no democratic process. There was no public hearings. There was no notice and comment rulemaking. No scientific citation shown to any of us. And yet that was a direct assault on our right to assembly. We had every business, 3.3 million businesses in this country closed down in violation of the Fifth Amendment right to due process and just compensation. None of them were given due process or just compensation. We had the Seventh Amendment jury trial shut down against anybody who was providing a medical countermeasure, no matter how egregious their, your injury, no matter how, um, how, uh, how reckless or negligent their behavior, you can't sue them. And that's a violation of the Seventh Amendment. So there's a lot of people in this country who are watching this happen and say our entire Constitution is under attack. And the only, the only provision that was not under attack is the Second Amendment. And a lot of the people who believe strongly about guns say, well, the reason they didn't attack the Second Amendment is because we have our guns. Now, whether you believe that or not, and I, you know, I, I'm not going to take a position on that one way or the other, but going after people's guns at this point in history, it, to me, is just going to cause more polarization and make it so that we can't listen to each other anymore because we get put into these kind of tribal silos where, which we have to somehow figure out a way to get past. So, oh, you know, my policy is going to be to figure out ways to protect these children. We cannot have any more school shootings. And, you know, one of the things, um, you know, even if that means 
protecting schools the same way that we protect airlines. You don't get shootings on airlines anymore. If we have to do that, we have to protect our children. The other thing we need to look at is the other reasons why this may be happening in our country. And you know, I've gotten ridiculed for saying that we need to look at the issue of the SSRIs. If we, at, but it's one of the issues we need to look at. We need to look at video games. We need to look at uh, the you know, way that uh, social media is affecting people's behaviors and do the scientific studies that are required for that. There has never been a time in human history when strangers would walk into a, a, a room of children and begin shooting people. What happened? You know, I, we had guns when I was a kid. At the, you know, I went to school where we had a gun club in the school and kids would come with their rifles to school. And nobody, was, nobody even imagined that somebody would go in that school and start shooting children. There's other countries that have as, almost as many guns as we do, like Switzerland, that don't have school shootings. So what is going on here? The last school shooting in Switzerland was 21 years ago. We have school shootings every 21 hours. One of the things we need to look at are SSRIs. There is one study that shows that at least 23% of school shootings have, involved, have that the shooter was at the time or prior or before was on SSRIs. So, um, and if you look at the label, the manufacturing the insert for these drugs, they say on them homicidal and suicidal ideation and action. So it's not insane to say we should look at this. Something changed in our country that started this. And it's not the guns. It, because we've always had the guns. Something else happened and we need to be looking. And that's the function of NIH. This is the biggest health threat in our country, these shootings. NIH is supposed to be doing science that actually looks at the cause. The, pro the problem is it doesn't want to do anything that will offend the pharmaceutical industry. So they will not even do a genuine study, and it's hard for the public or the press to figure it out because of the, uh, the HIPAA laws. You can't get that information on these shooters. But NIH can get the information, but it won't do it because it does not want to offend the pharmaceutical companies, and we ought to at least be looking at that. Mr. Kennedy, we've got about a minute left. I want to ask you a quick question here about the immigration. The crisis at the border couldn't be worse. What if in four years we're looking at not just a quarter of a million coming to the border every month, but half a million, 750 million? What do you do with all those you people? You know, I would like to have time to answer that question and tell people what I saw when I went to the border because I, I saw something that was incomprehensible to me. It took me three years, three days down there to actually understand what is happening and how absolutely insane it is. Where, you know, I watch probably 250 people walk across the border. They get registered right there by the, the Border Patrol no, no longer blocks them. These people aren't sneaking. They're coming across in bus loads. And they're brought there by the cartels, which are now running U.S. policy, U.S. border policy. There's seven million have come across in three years. They just walk across, and then they um, and they're registered by the, the uh, by the, the border patrol, Mr. and Kennedy. then they're put on planes to any place in the world. Why don't and we, we pick this up? We'll okay. pick this up on the website. Sorry. Okay. All right. Yeah. So hey. This is continuing on the web, another 30 minutes commercial free next week. If for those of you watching on TV, Marianne Williamson is here for conversation with the candidate. But hey, we're going to continue with immigration with Robert F. Kennedy when we come back. Thank you for watching Conversation with the Candidate.